when I came here, I really didn't know that I was going to go into fine art or anything like that. Um, basically, I just met my wife, and we were pregnant with uh, with our first child, and so life was really going fast for me. And like a lot of you, I was still kind of uh, getting into the idea of even finding a career, and I wasn't quite sure what that career was going to be. Now, I knew that I loved art, and I knew that that was what I had a talent for, but I didn't know if that was really practical to go in for a, to for a living, you know, and, and uh, it's just one of those things that I think a lot of us go through at one point or another in our life. Do I follow my passion? Do I follow what I truly love? Or do I go into something that's a little bit safer or more practical? And you get a lot of advice uh, through your life where people will tell you, uh, well-meaning people will tell you, uh, have a backup plan, you know, especially when you're younger and you want to be, you know, a professional athlete or an artist or something really romantic like that. And uh, a lot of people around you will say, well, have a backup plan. You know, do this because it's safe. Um, in fact, I remember specifically my mom telling me a story like that about uh, her dad. Uh, he told her to go and get her teaching degree just in case some other things that she wanted to do didn't work out. She ended up falling back on that teaching degree, you know, and to this day uh, she's a kindergarten teacher, which she loves and, and truly does have a passion for. But uh, when I called my parents, they're a little different. Uh, they had eight kids. And they were, uh, they were hippies in California, right in the thick of it. And so when I called them and I said, you know, we're pregnant, we're going to have a baby, I don't know what I'm going to go into, I'm done with all my general studies, i got to pick a major. Um, and, I, and my dad said to me, well, what do you love? And I said, well, I really love art, and I'm drawing all the time, Dad. I'm, I've really gotten better at it, and I think I'd love to do that. But I just don't know if it's practical, Dad. I mean, I got to make a living for the, you know, the kids. I got to raise a family now. And my dad, uh, you know, he said over the phone, I could almost see his face, you know, and and he's he's totally bald now, and you'd never see that hippie in him if he walked into this room. In fact, he looks a lot like Coach Meyer when he comes and visits Aberdeen. Everybody thinks he's Coach Meyer. They think I'm walking around with Coach, but uh, but he said over the phone, you know, follow your passion. Follow what you truly love, and you'll always be a success. Even if you don't make a dime at it, you'll always be a success if you just follow that. And I think that's what he wished he'd have done with, with his career. And he did, incidentally, later in, in life. But, uh, but so a long story short, I went into art here at Northern State. I went and met with Dr. Lefebvre, and he walked me around the art department. And I was really impressed. You know, I saw the, the facilities, and I thought, yeah, this is, this is a good place. And I had a good feeling about it. So I started as an art education major. So I was kind of halfway with, with uh, one foot into to what I loved and had a passion for. But really, my dream, like most of the, the kids in the art department, was to be able to produce and create my own artwork and just make a living doing my artwork, which is you know kind of, I guess, one of those dreams that some of you maybe can relate to if you're in sports. It's one of those things that you look at and you think, boy, that would be great if I could play football for the rest of my life or if I could play basketball or some of you that are in theater and dance. If I could dance and just make a living at that or if I could be in theater and just act for a living, that would be a wonderful thing. But you don't really think of it as being something that will materialize, at least not very quickly. And so I went into art ed thinking, well, I could also teach art and that will be something that will kind of give me a fallback plan. So I guess I was following my passion, but I still had a little bit of practicality there. Uh, so long story short, I started as an art student here at Northern, and I'm taking the drawing classes, and I, I showed a good aptitude for that, but I took Sculpture one class, and I did the sculpture of a little pregnant woman while my wife was pregnant with our first, and she was about nine months pregnant at the time, so there's this little terracotta sculpture of a woman with this huge belly, you know. By then it was like a globe out to here and and uh and you know she's she's really skinny as Nikki will tell you so it looked kind of funny like you'd see her from the back or or something you couldn't even tell she was pregnant and then she turned sideways and there's this huge gigantic belly and so I I did this sculpture and it turned out really nice you know I was I was actually surprised about it and my professor was very pleased and so every semester since I took sculpture um because I found just a joy and a freedom in that media that I didn't have in the other uh, forms of art. And so the first uh, life-size piece that I did came along 
rather quickly. It was actually the second semester that I took art that I did the piece on the screen here. And it's a life-size sculpture of Samson. And my professor at the time, Joel McKinney, uh, he's, he's since moved on. He doesn't work here anymore, but, uh, but he was a really great professor. And uh, one of the things he did is he gave all of his students a great level of confidence. And he told me later, you know, this is like a couple years later, we still keep in touch to this day. And he said, boy, when you told me you were going to do a life-size sculpture, you know, and I'd only done these little tiny terracotta figurines, he said, I thought you were just going to fall on your face. And so I didn't say anything, but I thought it would probably be good for you anyway if you, if you learned by making a lot of mistakes. And so this was my semester project for my uh, second semester advanced sculpture class. And when Samson finished up, uh, and Joel did the critique. He was surprised and very happy with it. And needless to say, he pushed me on and, and helped me uh, to go around the country and meet other sculptors and really learn the trade even further because he wasn't doing realistic art. And so it would have been hard for him to give me the technical advice I needed. But he was very supportive in that way. And so uh, after Samson was finished, that was really a milestone for me because not only did I gain confidence in my artwork, but now I had a piece in my portfolio that I could really show that, that was impressive enough to be uh, at least compared to the professionals that were out there. Um, but at the same time, I was still uh, a student. I was in my sophomore year, and I was working part-time at the YMCA and just trying to remain, you know, stay afloat while raising a family and going to school, which, which some of you know is very hard to do. And so uh, as, as time moved on a little bit and I was working and trying to do the artwork on the side, um, I got a call one morning from our local airport. And I'll switch slides here. Um, they were building a new airport here in Aberdeen. And some of you that have flown in are familiar with the building now. And they wanted to do a sculpture for the front a war memorial sculpture that would represent all wars and all the soldiers that have fought for the freedom of our country and that would really put a nice capstone on the new war memorial building. And so here was this piece and this opportunity that came my way out of the blue. And when Dr. Broadhurst from the sculpture uh, selection committee for the airport called me up, they had already interviewed some other professional artists. and. Uh, to tell you the truth, at that time I needed money so bad I would have probably cleaned the floors at the airport if he, if he would have called and said, we, we've got a job for eight bucks an hour, you can clean the floors in the bathrooms or something. I would have said, you bet, you know, and, and that's the thing. I guess if, uh, if, I'm, if I must talk as a, as a good uh, spokesperson and go through point after point, the first point, I guess, to success is to uh, give yourself an opportunity to fail, and I think that's kind of what Samson was along the, the way is that I tried something that maybe a lot of students are afraid to try. And if you don't try, you never know. And I would have never known that, that I could do that sort of thing if I hadn't have done something that I could have fallen flat on my face in. And I've tried to keep that in mind to this day as I go along. And then the next step is that there always seems to be somebody like a Joel McKinney that is there to help you and help your abilities move along and give you confidence to keep trying things that you may very well fail at. And then the third thing is that there, there has to be a little bit of chance there, a little bit of destiny, as I like to call it, where you get a call in the middle of the day and somebody says to you, hey, we've got a $220,000 sculpture that we're going to do in front of our building. You're a sophomore in college, and you've never done anything professionally. Do you want to try it? You know, do you want to have a crack at it? You know, so I was just floored uh, that he was calling about that. So I stayed up for about three nights straight doing drawings and, and all these different sizes drawings and, and pieces and concepts of what their sculpture could be. And I came in, met with the sculpture committee, and talked with them. And they were happy with uh, what I presented. And, and really, uh, it was quite an amazing thing to think of that as a student and going into something that professionals have already presented to and actually having a committee that's receptive to hearing your ideas. So that was in itself enough. But beyond that, they said, hey, we like what you've got. Can you do a scale model? I said, you bet. Yeah, we want to take it to the city hall meeting. And, and uh, so can you have it 
by Monday. Well, this was Friday, and, and so I, you know, being a student and having never done anything like this, and knowing, you know, I had never done, uh, I'll, I'll, I'll tell you that side of the story in a minute, but, but just not knowing even how long this would take, I said, yes, you bet, I can have it by Monday. So I got this model together, and I, I did, I, I spent uh, sleepless nights, so if there's another point along the way, it's that, that when opportunity does knock, when it comes your way, just put in, put everything into it. Put everything into it. You know, don't don't hold back. Don't leave anything back. And that that's really what happened to me. I think uh, I did. Uh, I was humbled to be having this opportunity to the point where I said, I don't care what it takes. And Julie was bringing me meals at the studio, and I was sleeping when I could. You know, to get this done by the Monday, and I I had it pretty well finished by Monday, and we took it into City Hall, and it got approved. And so uh, I was in the process of creating this monument of three soldiers. And the first figure shown here, and you can see the scale with me next to it. Now keep in mind, I had only done a five foot six inch tall sculpture of Samson before this. And so here I was thrown right into the fire to do the sculpture of a soldier that's seven foot six inches tall. It's huge, over life size. I've never done anything like this, and I have this contract signed and money paid, and so the pressure's on. <laughs> and so, uh, so I started right away here at Northern and, and in the physical plant. And, uh, you know, just with, with the network around me of people uh, helping and, and uh, I guess, giving me the confidence to go through with it, the piece turned out, and we dedicated it on Veterans Day, November 11th. And so life is moving along, and it's looking good. And by the time the piece was dedicated, um, I had decided I was going to drop the education portion of my major and just go into fine art and try to make it as an artist. Well, um, that's all fine and good, and it's great to get a big commission like this, to get a good commission. You know, it's really something else. And I did feel like, uh, like a lot of artists, hey, I've got this one piece. If I don't do anything else the rest of my life, I'm okay. <laughs> like, that'll be out there at our airport. And uh, so I had the one sculpture in the center with the flag. And then um, a huge opportunity came over the phone. My brother called and said, they're doing a sculpture for the US Capitol. And it's to be of Sarah Winnemucca, who was a Native American woman that fought for Paiute rights uh, at the turn of the century in Nevada. And they were going to place this in the US Capitol in Washington, DC. And so, of course, you know, most of you probably have siblings like that that are really supportive that maybe watch your athletic events or if you do any other type of activity, and they think you could be in the NBA because you scored 20 points at the Y pickup ball or something, you know? And so that's kind of how my brother w was. He said, you did this great sculpture. I don't care. You're good enough. Enter for this at, th at the Capitol. And I, you know, didn't have... Uh, any sort of confidence. I was the naysayer, and I said, you know, there's no way this isn't the type of thing I'm going to uh, get, so it's a waste of time. And uh, he talked me into it, being, being a good older brother. And so I filled out the extensive application and sent it in, and I thought, well, if nothing else, it'll be a good opportunity to learn how to fill out the applications and learn what's necessary to enter for these type of national competitions, because that's really a whole other level. And it's a whole other ball of wax. And when you enter it, you see that it's, it's uh, really a lot is required. And at that time, I had they required that you had, at minimum, three uh, full-scale pieces commissioned. OK, and I've told the committee this later. But I had Samson, which wasn't really commissioned. And I put that in my portfolio. And I had the Soldier, which was commissioned. And then I had Delilah, which I was working on, but wasn't even finished or commissioned. And I sent those in as my three commissioned pieces. So I really didn't have much to show them, but I showed some good detail shots of what I did have. And it's kind of a, a neat thing because you could have, you, you know, you could, you could look at it like uh, I should have looked at the requirements and just said, well, I'm not really eligible. I'll enter this in a couple of years. And my opportunity would have just passed me by. I would have never, never known. And I would have said, oh, I wouldn't have got it anyway and moved on with life. And I think that's how a lot of us are with, with things that come our way is we, we don't really give ourselves that chance that maybe I have a 1% chance of getting this dream job or this dream uh, to happen in my life. But 
if I don't enter, I have a 0% chance. You know, like the old saying, you miss 100% of the shots that you don't shoot. And so this was a shot, and I took the shot at it, and I figured I, I would definitely fail. Um, and the, I don't remember the exact date that they were notifying finalists, but that date passed by about four days. And so I said, okay, so I'm not a finalist because I didn't get a call. Well, they called, and they said the committee was running behind schedule, but you were chosen as one of our four finalists. And so, of course, I'm on the phone here. I was in the NSU Computer Center, and Ann Eisenbeis, who's been here forever, I, I hugged her, and, and I was just going nuts. And, you know, she's looking at me like, what's going on? You know, when I got the news, I was one of the four finalists. And so I spent the next month and a half um, preparing this scale model, a three-foot sculpture of Sarah Winnemucca. And I'll click on that so you can get a look at it, and you can see that I really didn't spare any detail or any bit of the work. And I think that is just another example um, of an important um, attitude towards success. In fact, this is the full scale. Let's go to the. This is the small scale, three foot version that I brought in for the competition. I took every minute seriously um, while I was working on the piece, and I thought, you know. I was going against artists that were nationally known and that had a lot of work out there. One of them, in fact, had, has a piece that has over 50 life-size figures in it, and he's really well known. And so I thought, my chances of getting this for the Capitol building are very, very low, but I'm not going to leave anything undone because if I don't get it, I know I'm going to be disappointed, but I'm really going to be disappointed if I didn't give it my absolute best effort. If I didn't give it my best shot, then I'm going to look at it as though I'll always look back and say, well, if I would have done this, maybe I would have had a better chance, or if I would have done that. And so when I put together the piece, and as I was doing the detail, and you, you can't see it because of the lighting in here, but the, the tiny fringes, you know, putting each one on there, and the hours and hours that it took to poke the, the holes, there's a texture along the dress here. There's over 13,000 holes that I poked in there with the tip of a nail. You know, when you spend those kinds of nights doing something like that, you really have to have a passion for it, and you really have to want and believe that you're doing your best on the piece, not, not that you're uh, holding anything back or leaving it up to them to beat you. And so uh, when I came in there with this maquette, I was very confident in the piece itself, but I still... I think all along had a sense that I was just lucky to be there and that even if I didn't win, that it was kind of nice that I had made the final four um, in this big competition. And uh, with the last name of Victor, I was last in the group to present. And so uh, each artist presented and none of us could see the other artist's presentations or the other artist's pieces. So they had gone through the day and, and you had uh, the artist presenting and I was supposed to go to a lunch because mine was after lunch, my presentation. So they had two that went before lunch and two after. And after the first two went, I was supposed to go to lunch and meet the governor and all these officials that were going to be at the lunch there. Well, I was so nervous. I was so nervous. I didn't eat or drink anything all day. You know, I, I just couldn't, I couldn't function really. I was just that nervous. And I, I totally forgot about the lunch with the governor. And so I spent, my, my brother, the one who had notified me about the competition, had come up. And he was helping me, and he had said earlier in the day, well, let's go work out or something. It'll get you relaxed. You'll feel a little better before your meeting. So we were working out during the governor's lunch that, that I was supposed to, supposed to be. So I stood up the governor before my meeting. So I'm really, really setting up some bad things here for my meeting. And uh, then I go to show up, and I had written out these meticulous notes about the piece, about every little thing on the, on the sculpture, from the fringes and how the design went upward into her eyes gazing on that flower, and the flower is the symbol for peace, and it's also her namesake. Her namesake in Paiute, Somatoniga, means shell flower. And so her name, shell flower, was also a symbol of peace, which she represented. And so I had this great artist statement, and I was all ready, and I had these meticulous notes that I had taken, you know, and spent a lot of time on. And my brother said, you know, before the thing, you know, if, if you really bomb, you're really nervous, uh, I'm not going to come in. I'm just, I'll just drive off. I'll leave you here. That way, if you do really bad, nobody will know. You can tell me you did great, 
and, uh, and, and you know, it'll be fine. So I thought, that's a great idea. Good, good. <laughs> and so he helps me carry this thing in. It's three feet high, so it's, it's fairly heavy. So we both carry it in. And he's like, all right, I'm going to take off, shakes my hand and goes. And I realize he has my meticulous notes in the van with him. And so I have no notes. And I'm stuck here and no way of contacting him. Because remember, now I have the one commission on me, but I don't, we didn't have a lot of money at the time. I didn't have a cell phone. So there's no way to call him or, or anything. And it was go time. You know, the committee's sitting there at this big table. And they've all got poker faces and suits and ties. You know, and here I am, a young student that shouldn't even be in the competition. I've spent all this time on it. And my notes are gone. I'm nervous as heck. And I'm standing there. And I'm ready to go. And uh, they introduce me. I come up. And uh, the, the thoughts are all racing through my head. What do I talk about? And then I stopped, and I calmed down. And this has really helped me in every competition since, is that I stopped, I calmed down, I looked at the piece, and I said, wait a minute. I created this piece. I know what it's about. All I have to do is tell them how I created it and what it's about. And so I went through it, and I started to talk about how I started, how I got the concept of her being in motion, because she was an activist, how I got the concept of wind, because she brought about change, and what all the icons meant, the book in her left hand, was an icon for education because she started the first school for Paiute children. And I went up through the piece and about the flower and everything else. And by the time I was done, this poker face committee was asking questions about the piece, and I knew that was a good thing. They went back, and that night they made a decision at about 7 p.m. And I was sitting there, and all the other artists were sitting there too. And uh, they said that I would get to do this piece for the U.S. Capitol. And the state historian stood up. And I'll never forget it. He shook my hand and he said, your life will never be the same. <laughs> and he was right. <laughs> so the commissions rolled in after that. And I'll take questions here in a minute. But I'll go through just a few of the, the bigger commissions um, that I've done since. And then we can talk about any of them that you'd like or any of the creative process in uh, technical detail. But I've done recently a US Marines monument um, in Newport Beach, California. I've worked on uh, a firefighter's monument in Kansas, and I'm currently working on another one with three firefighters for the state capitol in Kansas. Um, I'm doing an eight-foot World War II airman for Boise, Idaho at Boise Airport. Uh, you know, the, the list has gone on and on, and it's been so busy in there sometimes that I don't think I can even keep up. But uh, things have just spiraled out of control like that. And it's funny when you look back at the beginnings of that success that there are just those few little things that you can do to help give yourself the opportunity to succeed. And that's really what I'm getting at when I talk about uh, the startings here is, first of all, that I didn't see any of this coming, but that the way you act and react towards opportunity is what's going to dictate um, whether or not you have success in whatever career you go into. You know, follow what you have a passion for. When opportunity comes, give yourself the chance. Give yourself the opportunity to fail even. And then also really surround yourself and be around those people that build you up and bring you up and want to help you to succeed in whatever you do. So do any of you have any questions about the work I do or any of the pieces? Do you want the mic to go around? Any questions at all? <laughs> yes. <laughs> you want to give? Yeah. Yeah. You bet. Yeah, and you can ask about any of them if you. Ben, I was going to comment on your Jesus with the children. Ben allowed us to put the Jesus with the children in our church just to display for a short period of time, but yeah, it was but so uh, people took to it right away, and within half an hour, people had pledged three thousand dollars worth, and in a few short months. Pe the people of the church, we hadn't put it in there with the intent of buying it, but the people had pledged enough money that it is now a permanent fixture in our church. I guess he's not on here. I can't show you. You'll have to go to Zion Lutheran to see the Jesus <laughs> of Job. <laughs> now everyone will be at Zion Lutheran on Sunday. <laughs> here, I'll click on Bell. If, if, uh, what was it that brought you to Aberdeen? Um, California, of all places. Well, I went to uh, Trinity Bible in Ellendale with three of my friends from California, and we played basketball there. 
uh, for a couple years, and we got our general studies out of the way. And then, um, like I said, I was kind of searching for a major, and Trinity's real limited on majors. And so we, we had traveled a lot to Aberdeen because there's really nothing in Hollandale. I mean, it's a really small town. So you'd come here to shop or anything like that. So we were familiar with Northern, and I came here and just, just got a tour, and I really wasn't sure. I thought I might go back to California. But when I came here and, and saw the school, I thought, this is about the perfect size of what I wanted. I wanted a school. I didn't want to go somewhere just huge. Um, like, I, I, like I said, I'm from a family of eight, and so some of my brothers had gone on to UCLA and uh, one out east to Yale and these big schools where they've got a, a good reputation for academics, and rightfully so, but they're so big that you almost get lost in the mix. I'd visit them at the dorms, and just, you're just another face in the crowd. And here I felt like the professors and everything, like Dr. Lefebvre, when he gave me the tour, he really wanted me to go to school here. He really wanted me in the art department. That's different. That's a different feeling that, than you get at some of the larger schools. And so that um, really made me feel comfortable. And it, it really was the right choice. Because I think, and, and that's, that's just one of those things that um, I would attribute to, like, if any of you believe in fate or destiny. Because I didn't really um, plan that out. But if you look at how my career and everything progressed, and my artwork progressed, I really needed the professors that I had at that time and the community of students that we had. We were all friends in the art department. It was a small enough group where we all kind of bounced ideas off of each other and, and had the time and to, uh, to just care about each other. And, and it, you know, I'm really glad that that worked out the way it did. But it could have worked out much differently, I guess. presentation this morning is you got to be prepared or you not even have a chance at the opportunities. So you really have to prepare. And you don't know for what, but you have to. Yeah, and the work too, like I caught the end of Clark's. You know, the amount of work too is something that I don't know because I wasn't here for his whole presentation, but I don't know if he emphasized that. Like when opportunities do come, uh, you know, they're, they're always is going to come a point as an individual where you take the, the time and give the amount of work that is necessary to really capitalize on that opportunity that's come your way. You know, so when that happens, you can either uh, buck up, like they say, or you can cower and, and say, well, that's too much. Like, no, I can't have it for you by Monday. You know, that's out of the question. There wasn't going to be a no, no matter what they said. You know, they could have said, can you have it for us later today? And I was going to go, even though that's impossible, you know, you, you're you going to give it all that you can. And there's something about giving your all that I think is a common denominator of everybody's success, um, like you said, no matter what field you go into. Um, I do some painting, but not much anymore. I haven't had time. Um, it's just, it's so busy in the studio right now. I'm, I'm working on, like I named a few of the ones that I'm just recently working on. I just finished up this one of, of Belle Bab Mansfield. She's the first female attorney in the country. It's kind of neat, too, with my work. I've gotten to study um, a lot of history that I didn't really think I would, uh, would ever have an interest in. I, it's taken me into so many different areas of study that it's it's almost uh, very, just very eclectic. You know, women's history, Native American history, things that I never majored in in college, and I've just gotten out the books, you know, and gone into the library and really got a chance to study. But uh, but the oil painting is something, you know, to answer your question, that I would like to go back to when there's enough time. And I also have uh, a real hankering to do some marble sculpture, some carving. I ordered a 2,000, or I guess it's about 2,500 pound block of marble, and it's sitting in the backyard of the studio, and I, I just haven't gotten to it. It's just been so busy with the bronze work, and it's that way. Like when the state historian shook my hand and said that, I don't think it hit me at that time that the work would roll in the way it did after that. But it really uh, has been like a, a fight to keep up with it. But I think at some point uh, things will slow a little where I can do some of the things like oil painting and just try my hand at marble sculpture uh, just for fun, you know, and just to see if I can do it. 
But until then, you know, this is not only a great way to uh, make a living, but it's what I enjoy the most. You know, in fact, my wife uh, often gets a little frustrated at that because I could just work all the time because <laughs> I like it so much. So I have to put the brakes on every now and then and, and make sure I don't work too much. So. Nikki was a great waitress. In about, what, like probably five minutes of conversation that you have with a waitress, she found out about her whole life, what we were doing here in Aberdeen that Julie was expecting. So she, she knew all about us just like that, and she's been great. And she's been really exemplary of the people in Aberdeen, actually, because since we've moved here, um, and my parents, when they come and visit from California, you know, from the city, uh, they always say after every visit, I can't believe how polite and how friendly everybody is here, you know, and maybe that's an exaggeration, maybe not everybody, but just about everybody. I mean, this is one of the, the most friendly towns in the country, and all of my family that comes visits, whether they're from the East Coast or West Coast, they just can't believe, you know, the, the sense of community and the friendliness that you have here. And so, yeah, Nikki was, yeah. That's a tough one. You know, it's always different with each piece. I think when I do like a, a monument, like the last one to the Marines, when we dedicated it and you see the tears in an old Marine's eyes. There's a Marine there that, that fought and he brought a picture and he, he uh, fought in Guadalcanal and he had a picture of the graveyard where all of his friends were buried. And he showed me, this is all their graves right here. I'm the only one left, and, he, and tears are rolling down, and he sees this soldier there, and he talks to you about the concept, and I mean, that that gets you, and then when you see the pride, too, in the, the firefighter's eyes, you know, when I've done the firefighter monuments, and they look at it, and that bravery, and it's like a thank you to them, you know, that's very fulfilling, and then, of course, you know, it's hard because it with Sarah Winnemucca, with the Native American people that came in, the Paiute tribes came in, and they gave me an eagle feather. I probably shouldn't say this on camera because it's really illegal for me to have it because I'm not Native American. But they, they um, accepted me into Sarah Winnemucca's family by giving me an eagle feather that is from one eagle that only the family members have feathers from that eagle. You know, things like that that I'm just floored that my artwork has been able to... to uh, kind of bridge and bring me into other people's lives and, and uh, I guess take me into doing something that's more meaningful than I ever thought I would be able to do. I think when I was an art student, I, I thought, and I still do love to do pieces that are self-actualizing pieces, that the sculptures that I do that are about what I'm feeling or what I'm thinking or maybe what my philosophies on the world are. But I think when you're a student, you think that that's all you're going to do. You know, I'm just going to like paint man, you know, and everyone's going to just see my soul on this canvas, you know, that's how you are when you're a student, and, but, you know, now that I'm doing the commissioned work, it's really uh, much more fulfilling to me to present a piece of artwork that is selfless in a way, you put all that work in, but it touches somebody else, and it's not all about you, it's about them, and, and that's, uh, that's probably been the most rewarding thing and, and the most unexpected thing that I've, I've had in doing this type of artwork. Well, if that's all the questions, thank you for coming. It's been a pleasure.